this section is organized in two parts. Firstly, we'll talk a little bit about what we've learned about the pharmacological treatment of schizophrenia, because that's what we're here to discuss, pharmacotherapy uh, of, uh, of major disorders uh, amongst adults. I mean, that's, that's the uh, basic agenda for this meeting. So we'll talk a little bit about what we've learned about the pharmacological treatment of, and what's happened in the pharmacological treatment of schizophrenia over the last couple of years. I'm not going to burden you, unlike past times, with a detailed discussion of any specific studies as such. Uh, we'll really look at the broad picture of what's happened, what's changed. And the second part of this presentation, we'll really pour into uh, the specific guidelines that we have and discuss whether we want to retain them as they are or make uh, some changes based on what we learn. Disclosures, uh, I don't have any current financial conflicts of interest with uh, reference to this particular uh, meeting uh, or its agenda, but I do have biases which I bring to my uh, presentation and to my participation uh, in this process. I'm a clinician. I've been a clinician for 30 years, and I, I, bring, a, I bring a clinician's bias. Don't give me speculation. Don't, uh, I, I like your brilliance, but I really want hard facts. Uh, I want to know what I can really apply in my clinical practice, uh, and I want things that I can do that are practicable, uh, not fantasy. I also, I'm, I've also been a clinical researcher for over 25 years, and I bring that particular bias with me as well uh, in, in the context of this participation. The rigor, uh, not the clinicians. I, I, I value my clinicians' hope, but I also want it to be backed by hard data. Where are the facts? Where are the data? Uh, where is the evidence? And how can we bring the two things together? So th those are biases that I do want to acknowledge going ahead. And in terms of the first part of the presentation, the first 50 minutes or so, uh, I thought it might be useful for us to explore uh, what's happening in terms of the definition of schizophrenia uh, with regards to DSM-5. It might also give you some insight into the progress with regards to DSM-5, as you know, uh, the fifth edition of our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, is scheduled to be published in May of 2013. It's going to be released at the San Francisco APA meeting in 2013. And its development has been in progress for over f since 1999. Uh, there have been a whole series of steps uh, that have been taken. Uh, so I'll share with you a little bit about where it's at uh, with specific reference to schizophrenia. I think it's useful for us to do this because diagnosis is a big part of the treatment process. And if one thinks about uh, our organization of our meeting, it's organized around treatment guidelines for schizophrenia, treatment guidelines for bipolar disorder, treatment guidelines for major depressive disorder. And hence, it's useful to know, well, what are these uh, diagnostic uh, criteria and how might they change? We'll talk a little bit about new developments in the pharmacotherapy of schizophrenia since 2009, when we last met. Uh, briefly look at what's, what the future holds uh, and what might happen uh, in the next five to 10 years. But I, I'm, I'll mention a couple of things that are likely to happen in the next two years, uh, which might be relevant as we think, because we're not going to meet for at least another couple of years. And then go, uh, bridge it to uh, development of guidelines and what uh, clinical lessons we can draw from this information. So let's start with a brief discussion of the definition of schizophrenia. So if I was to ask you, uh, you've been, you know, you diagnose schizophrenia all the time. Today, what are some of the major issues or challenges uh, in terms of the diagnostic criteria or process for schizophrenia? What would you say? Uh, it's perfect the way it is. No, I see a lot of nods. No, so what's what's not perfect? What would you like changed? What would you? What's not good? It's, well, it's very subjective. It's subjective. Um, I think part of the problem in terms of you know issues that you raise with schizophrenia apply to all to our diagnostic system at large, which is that all of us take di the process of diagnosis less seriously than we might want to. 
uh, we, you know, and diagnoses add up. And some of the issues uh, pervade all of DSM. High amounts of not otherwise specified diagnoses. High comorbidity. No one has one diagnosis. No one even has two or three or four. I mean, the average number of diagnoses that any individual has is four to five. And some have up to 10, 12 diagnoses. Uh, and it's irrational to believe that they have 12 different disorders uh, that uh, need to be targeted, that, that, uh, that are uh, in pro uh, progress for them. But specifically with regard to schizophrenia, these are some of the issues that we identified. Uh, I should acknowledge, as uh, Dr. Constantine noted, uh, I am a member of the DSM-5 work group on schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. And we have 10 other members. Uh, and these were some of the challenges that we identified with regard to schizophrenia specifically. Simplify. Uh, make the diagnostic criteria simple. And are these subtypes useful? We've had them for since 100 years, since Kraepelin. But uh, is, is, there, is subtyping useful? Do you use subtypes? Uh, do any of you use? I'm sorry? Well, but if you look at your own, if you go back to your own uh, databases, value options, for example, Magellan, Access, and you look at uh, diagnosis of schizophrenia, 295, mo what are the, uh, so, uh, how often is 295.1 diagnosed? How often is 295.2 <laughs> diagnosed? And what are those anyway? I mean, if you think about it, uh, how many of us know that 295.3, for example, is paranoid sch schizophrenia? I mean, we don't really keep up with that terminology. If you don't know it, don't learn it because we're moving to DSM-10, where schizophrenia is F20. And then when we move to DSM-11, it's going to be something else. I mean, the whole entire nomenclature is changing. And so let's stay away from the But this was one issue. Simplify, and are current subtypes useful? We had a discussion briefly yesterday about schizoaffective disorder. Why is schizoaffective uh, disorder uh, allowed uh, in terms of the study, in terms of the switch study? Well, how do you dif differentiate schizophrenia from schizoaffective disorder? Is it easy to do it with the criteria we have? Uh, or we, do we just kind of treat the two interchangeably? And a third issue that's become more important, uh, I don't know how many of you see a lot of catatonia. Uh, there is a lot of catatonia, which we might not see. About 10% of all inpatients uh, have varying amounts of catatonic symptomatology. That's huge. It's not diagnosed. And th there might be challenges uh, which make that difficult. Another thing that we decided we wanted to do was we wanted to incorporate new information. What had we learned about the nature of schizophrenia uh, and other psychotic disorders, for that matter, since uh, 1994, which was when DSM-4 came out? The text revision, DSM-4-TR in 2000, really did not involve any changes whatsoever to any criteria. Uh, it was just a text revision. And so uh, since 1994, what were some new learnings about schizophrenia? And there were two important things that we learned about schizophrenia. One, there were multiple dimensions of schizophrenic illness. And that's relevant to treatment as well as we come to treatment guidelines. That it's not just delusion, it's not just one thing. There are at least six different dimensions of schizophrenic illness that you need to pay attention to, perhaps because there are different uh, pathophysiological mechanisms that might underlie them. They have different patterns of response to treatment. And positive symptoms or reality distortion, disorganization, negative symptoms, cognitive deficits, motor symptoms, and mood symptoms. That there are at least six different dimensions which are important to distinguish as one's treating pa persons with schizophrenia. And the second thing, you know, two of you mentioned that your sites for the RACE study. And one of the things that's happened in the last 15 to 20 years is a lot of attention to early intervention and the possibility of prevention. Can we prevent the devastation of schizophrenia if we intervene early? If we detect the first psychotic episode as early as possible and intervene, can we limit the deterioration that occurs? And even better, even before the first psychotic episode, can we identify those at particularly high risk and do something that might reduce the likelihood that those individuals will go on to develop schizophrenia. And so 
we've recognized there are different distinct stages of schizophrenic illness. So in terms of new learning since 1994, these are some, uh, some of the relevant things that we've learned. One, it has multiple psychopathological dimensions, very relevant from a treatment perspective. There are distinct stages of illness. There's a lot of interest in early intervention prevention, and the RACE study is an example of the investment of the National Institute of Health uh, in this effort. Mood symptoms can be prominent. DSM-3 changed the way we looked at schizophrenia. The idea in DSM-3 was, after DSM-3, a little mood symptoms means you've got mood disorder with varying amounts of psychosis. Before DSM-3, DSM-1, DSM-2, a little psychosis was schizophrenia. After DSM-3, you can have as much psychosis as you have, but if you have prominent mood symptoms, it's a mood disorder or perhaps schizoaffective. But a recognition that mood symptoms are an integral part of schizophrenia itself. Subtypes are not stable. One of the reasons you don't use subtypes is because they're not stable. It's paranoid today and it's catatonic tomorrow and it's disorganized, you know, two years hence. Uh, by the way, the, these subtypes are not used. There was a large study in China, 20,000 patients discharged from a, uh, a big hospital in China with diagnoses of schizophrenia over a period of 10 years. 91% of them were diagnosed with undifferentiated schizophrenia. 4% were diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And the others, 1% or so. Well, that's China, you say, that's a huge study. If you look at database studies from, uh, from our country, what you find is the paranoid subtype is utilized, about 45 to 50%. About 40 to 45% is undifferentiated, and catatonic, disorganized, et cetera, 1% or so. And I would suggest, if you go back to your own uh, systems, you might actually find a third thing that's not a part of these studies, that a, f a significant proportion of patients will just have schizophrenia without any subtype, uh, if you will. And so subtypes are not stable, and they're not utilized. And perhaps we know that schizophrenia is a heterogeneous illness, and we've been trying to kind of describe that heterogeneity in the context of subtypes. Perhaps that heterogeneity is better understood in the context of distinct dimensions and multiple stages. And so we wanted to utilize these uh, learnings uh, in terms of revisions uh, to our uh, definition of schizophrenia. And so with the four basic changes that we are exploring, None of them have been decided upon. Uh, some of them are being field tested. But these are the four basic changes that we're exploring. A, eliminate subtypes. They're not useful. They're not used. Uh, they're not stable. Uh, they're not valid. Uh, and they serve little clinical purpose. And so eliminate them. Let's forget, uh, let's simplify uh, the, uh, the system. At the same time, perhaps, we should be assessing patients uh, when we see them, four dimensions. And this is a challenge that we'll talk about, but as a clinician, you know, you want to measure temperature, and you want to measure blood pressure, and you want to measure uh, heart rate, because they're all three different measures, if you will, that reflect different aspects of a person's health. Perhaps these dimensions, if we can identify dimensions that tell us something meaningful clinically about the patient and, and guide us with regard to how they're responding to treatment, Perhaps that might be something we wanted to add to our system. Should we add a diagnosis of individuals at ultra high risk for schizophrenia? Very controversial. I'll share a little bit about where that's at. But this was a second important consideration. The third thing we thought we had to do <coughs> was we had to better clarify the boundary between schizoaffective disorder and schizophrenia. For that matter, between schizoaffective disorder and psychotic bipolar disorder as well. But this is something that we felt we really had to address. And lastly, this link between catatonia and schizophrenia, it's not false because a lot of persons with schizophrenia do show catatonic symptoms. If you look at 100 persons with catatonia, about 15 to 20 percent will have a psychotic, will have schizophrenia but they have other conditions as well, and perhaps that link should be distinguished. So in terms of subtypes, this was the rationale, and this is what's being field tested right now. That perhaps 
there are seven dimensions that we should be assessing. Do it simply on a zero to four scale, develop anchors, we, and we, we've, we're field testing these anchors for the zero to four scale. And essentially seven, there were initially there were suggestions that you know, have 15 different dimensions, 20 different dimensions, clearly unworkable. A busy clinician, uh, we'll be lucky if they do seven, or we'll be lucky if they do three, if you will, for that matter. And so the, those are the things that are still being discussed, debated, and we await the results of the field trials. But the issue is when I'm treating a person with schizophrenia, perhaps it's useful to me to know what's changing. I'm using an antipsychotic. Has this gotten better? If this has improved and this is still prominent, depression is still prominent, maybe I need to be thinking of an antidepressant. If mania is prominent, maybe I think of a different treatment strategy. It's always useful for me to see what dimensions are responding or are not responding to treatment. And that will help me in terms of thinking about what might next best help the person or what I should do clinically.